Well, um, actually, this, this speaker does not really need much of presentation, especially to those who have uh, 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 worked in Japanese religion and uh, on, uh, on Chinese uh, Buddhism in general. Uh, but I will, I will give it a try. Uh, so, Professor Stephen Heiner is Professor of Religious Studies and History at the Florida International University, and where he also is Director of Religion Studies. He would be known to any of us as a very prolific writer on uh, Zen Buddhism. Um, he's written on Dogen, I think that was his first work, and has done really groundbreaking studies on uh, Dogen's major work, the Shogun book, on which I think he would tell yeah. us something today. Um, and he has also written a lot on a genre of uh, Zen writing, on the koan. Um, uh, your book on the uh, fox koan has been a favorite of my students for many, many years. Um, and on the history of Zen Buddhism in general. I would say that uh, uh, Professor Hain has also done a, a huge service to the field by editing uh, many important uh, books on Zen and something that have collected works uh, by major scholars uh, uh, of the tradition and uh, are again uh, wonderful uh, uh, tools for teaching on, uh, on the tradition. Um, he has written about 30 books, so I have the list here, but I thought I shouldn't be reading them, <laughs> but I think uh, uh, many of, uh, um, of, of, of the editor books also need to be mentioned. Um, he has also worked for, for, for since the beginning really of his career on uh, um, the relation of East and West, in particular um, what is known as the Kyoto School, the modern philosophy and uh, the work of Abe Masao. And that is also, uh, was also very important work. Um, I, I, I don't think you've gone back to that uh, recently, or have you? Uh, Not so much, yeah. But, uh, but at the beginning uh, um, yeah. was uh, we're talking about the 90s, uh, uh, it was right. very important work, again, for uh, uh, situate the, um, the, the genealogy, let's say, of the Kyoto School within the Zen tradition. Um, Mr. Hain has also received uh, um, honors uh, from the Japanese government, as read here, that's the, uh, the recipient of the Order of the Rising Sun Award, which is uh, an important award given to, to those who have uh, um, um, who have served really as a, uh, um, a bridge to, uh, between Japan and the, and the West and uh, served to propagate Japanese culture. And this is, uh, without a doubt, very well deserved. Um, his last book um, just came out a few months ago, I yep. believe. Uh, it's an edited book on Zen and material culture. And uh, I'm sure we'll all be looking uh, at it uh, after the talk. But uh, today we are going back to, as I said before, one of the most important uh, um, subjects of uh, Professor Hein's uh, research, that is the uh, Shogun. So without further ado, I leave you. Uh, you the floor. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Let me ask one quick question. How long should the speaking part be before? Uh, it's fairly, the speaking part around one hour, but if you want to go a bit more. It's oh, okay. No, no. Okay. okay. All right. All right. Good, good. Okay. Um, well, thank you again for inviting me and for the uh, kind introduction. It's, it's great to see uh, Lucia and, me, and meet some uh, new friends. And um, yeah, I'm very excited to talk about uh, Shobo Genzo once again. This is how my career started, and I, when I was in graduate school uh, 40 years ago, in the late 1970s, uh, I, I began studying uh, Shobo Genzo, and uh, at that time, uh, the early uh, translations and, and um, scholarly works on Shobo Genzo were just beginning to come out. Uh, probably many of you are aware that uh, for various reasons, and people attributed to uh, D.T. Suzuki's um, a Rinzai orientation. There wasn't much about Dogen until the 1970s, and all of a sudden there was a wave of uh, partial translations of Shobo Genzo and, and some other writings, and a couple of uh, very good scholarly works that are still useful today. Um, and uh, recently I was invited to, uh, to write a new book on Shobo Genzo for a series on, on Buddhist literature, and so I was reflecting back on those 40 years 
And uh, now there, uh, at, at that time, there were a couple of good partial translations, and there was one kind of notorious complete translation uh, that, that hasn't held up very well. But in recent years, there's, now there's about um, four or five newer complete translations. One of those is uh, still being completed by the uh, Stanford uh, Translation Project, um, led by Carl Bielefeld. And, um, I, I think they're getting closer to the uh, production stage because they've had a, uh, some of the material on the website for a long time. And they took the material down from the website, which was um, kind of a tragedy for me <laughs> not to have easy access. But then I was assured that that meant, uh, that was a good sign because it meant that the um, publication is getting closer and because of copyright issues, they, they had to remove it from the website. But anyway, uh, here's my point. What, so what's happened in those 40 years? Well, the, the newer translations are much more sensitive um, to the uh, Chinese Chan influences on Dogen and Dogen's appropriation of Chinese materials. Shobo Genzo is often referred to as the first vernacular text uh, in Japanese Buddhism. And, uh, but it's not exactly a vernacular text because it relies heavily on quotations of uh, Chinese Chan and some Mahayana Buddhist uh, uh, ch in sutras in Chinese. And Dogen um, kind of invents his own language. It's not exactly um, a kana or a vernacular language. It's not exactly kanbun either. He kind of invents his own language. And in doing so, uh, he's not only translating the Chinese sources, but he's taking the liberty to alter them. And this is, uh, in a way, a kind of basic point, but it's also an a all-encompassing point with many ramifications that uh, need to be dealt with, I think, in, in the scholarship and translation. I, I, I think that the uh, translations today are much more sensitive to some of those issues, and um, then, then they have to make decisions about how much annotation to use and whether, you know, and, and whether to still try to make it readable and, and to lose some of the nuance or not, but we can see that effort being made. So that, that's a very good thing. Uh, but then I realized one basic thing was, had been overlooked, I think almost entirely overlooked in Western scholarship. Of course, it's much more advanced in the, in the Japanese scholarship, um, which had to do with um, material about Shobo Genzo that had been uh, created in the interim period. So what happened between um, the 1250s when Dogen died and he was still in the act of editing Shobo Genzo at the time he died. So he never considered a complete text. And he himself seemed to divide it between uh, what he called the uh, old draft, <clears throat> or the early draft, and the new draft, um, or the later draft. Um, and, he, and, and his main disciple, Ejo, who was his, who was his main scribe and, and editor after Dogen died, also left uh, behind several different versions, and they contain different numbers of chapters or fascicles. They, um, sometimes those fascicles are in different versions and there's a different ordering to them. Some are left in, some are left out. And uh, the, uh, the scholarship in, in, in Japan has been dealing with that for quite extensively. The Western scholarship has touched on that. Uh, of course, uh, people like Carl Bielfeld and William Bonifert have, have dealt with that in, in creative ways. But, Generally, there hasn't been much said about what's happened since that time. Um, so, late Kamakura period, Morimachi period, Edo period. And what I started to realize was that um, there was kind of an echo chamber where a few things were said in Western scholarship and then other people seemed to see those few catchphrases and repeat them. And I think some misimpressions had been created to the effect that the Shobogenzo was not really a, at all important in the Soto sect for hundreds of years until all of a sudden in, in, the 19, in 1906, um, in connection with the 600, uh, how, how many years is that now? 1906 would be the um, um, 650th death anniversary of Dogen. There was a, um, a, a, the first typeset, modern typeset edition produced, which triggered off a lot of commentaries and additional scholarship. And so what happened in, in, in those um, six, seven hundred years in between? And I think there were a couple of uh, basic misimpressions which I'm going to get to. So after I um, 
I sent the original title, then I uh, added um, a main title, Outside of a Small Circle. Because a phrase that I see um, mentioned a number of times in the, in the Western scholarship is that, um, the, to the extent that it is talked about at all, is that, well, the Shobogenzo was only in the hands of a small circle of Soto specialists. Um, and other than that, nobody paid any attention to it. And even those people weren't really reading it in the way we would think of um, uh, scholarly studies. They, they had it more as a ritual object, as an iconic possession, as a, pre as a prestigious icon that would uh, give status to their temple. And there's some truth to that, of course, but I think that um, when you look at it closely, um, that, that's mostly untrue. And so I want to pick that apart historically and the first page of the handout um, gives a very brief overview of um, some material I've been working on um, by trying to track, um, you know, in one page, and I have, a, I have an article that, you know, is, mu is much longer and goes into detail about many of these items, but I tried to compress it here into one page to give an overview of what's happened historically in those six or seven hundred years. So let me briefly uh, talk about the handout and front and back pages and then go to the PowerPoint and then I will um, uh, come back to the uh, flip side of the handout which has to do with the particular passage that I want to analyze um, like ph philologically and philosophically uh, from um, one of the fascicles called Zazen Shin or the point of Zazen or the, or the uh, lancet or needle of Zazen. But let me just mention briefly about the, the fr front page. So if you look at that uh, six or seven hundred year period, generally what's said is that the uh, late Kamakura and Muromachi period was a dark age of sectarian studies. That's a, that's a phrase that's been used. It was, it was used in Japanese scholarship, it was picked up in some Western scholarship, and it's been repeated quite a bit. A dark age of sectarian studies, meaning there weren't any real scholarly studies of Shobogenzo or Dogen's other texts. And there's some truth to that, um, because if you look here, one, and two, we see that in the early 1300s, there were two prominent commentaries on Shobogenzo, quite different styles. One was in uh, prose, kind of line by line uh, commentary on each and every passage by um, uh, two um, monks who were, had been schooled in uh, Japanese Tendai Buddhism and are generally thought to have read uh, Shobogenzo in light of Tendai original enlightenment or Hongaku Shiso um, ideas. Um, and the other, uh, and that was a, a commentary on what's called the 75 fascicle edition of the Shobogenzo. And the other commentary was a prose commentary by Giyun, um, who was um, another lineage uh, of Dogen's following. And this is. Um, on a, the 60 fascicle version, and I realize it gets very te technical very quickly, but it's important to understand there, were, there was no clear definitive version of the Shobogenzo that they had, so different lineages had, had different versions. And then his was um, four line Chinese verses with a capping phrase, and it was not in line by line or interlinear discussion at all. It just kind of gives poetic impressions of the meaning of those and, and, and those were both completed by the 1310s, 1320s. And it is true that it, there weren't major commentaries in the Muromachi period. So it wasn't until uh, late 1600s that we start getting uh, extensive commentaries on Shobo Genzo. However, in the Muromachi period, we do see a lot of activity. There were different theories about um, how long, how many fascicles should be included in the Shobo Genzo. Different editions were produced, different copies being made. There were discussions about which were the authentic copies. Temples were exchanging copies and trying to consolidate them into uh, critical editions. And there were some uh, minor commentaries being used. When I say minor commentaries, I mean that they weren't completely dedicated to Shobo Genzo, but Shobo Genzo ideas were being discussed in, in poetry and prose uh, commentaries during Muromachi period. So, I don't really consider it a dark age because uh, there was a lot of activity. It just wasn't activity that's 
quite as easily recognizable uh, for what people tend to be looking for. Now, there was a vigorous revival of interest in the Edo period for various reasons. And in the, uh, what I tried to do here is compress um, that uh, five or six uh, main figures produced over 40 commentaries. Those are like, uh, you know, full volumes, sometimes they're multiple, multi-scrolled volumes of commentaries. Um, one, uh, one commentator, uh, Banjin uh, Dotan, who's, who's very well known for discussions of, um, of the precepts and for uh, the succession of lineage in the Soto sect, he produced 16 commentaries on uh, Shobo Genzo. Um, um, a couple more famous uh, figures, especially Menzan Zuiho, was probably the single main figure who, who wrote o o well over 100 volumes on various aspects of Dogen's uh, life and thought, had uh, nine commentaries. And, <coughs> and it, you know, that, that, li that list could be uh, enhanced because they had other works that dealt extensively with Shobo Genzo, but these, these are commentaries dedicated to particular fascicles or groups of fascicles or for the entire Shobo Genzo. Um, and um, that list could easily be doubled or tripled. Um, and I've documented that in an article of, of, uh, of uh, more than 80 prominent commentaries. So when you look at the Western scholarship, generally they'll say, oh yeah, there was a revival, and there were five or six commentaries. Menzon had one or two, and they mentioned a couple of others. Uh, but uh, it's been pretty much overlooked. Uh, the Japanese scholarship it goes into a tremendous detail because um, these are, you know, become a, becomes a multifaceted kind of um, scholarly game, so to speak, because there's the commentaries on the commentaries on the commentaries. So what happens in that period is that the, the commentators are lining up in different views and rebutting one another, uh, sometimes very harshly and sometimes um, more in a more uh, moderate tone. But there were very heated debates setting uh, off one another. So the one main school was by uh, 10K Denson, and he, was a, he turned out to be a critic of Dogen. And basically the idea that set in, going back to Dogen's use of uh, the Chinese was uh, how well did he know the Chinese and how well did he use the Chinese and why did he have all these uh, uh, points that seem like mistakes in the Chinese. And the uh, Tenke was a harsh critic. He lined up with another famous uh, Edo period scholar from that period, Mujaku Dochu, who's a, who's a Rinzai scholar. And they, they, they borrowed some ideas from each other and they had a list of criticisms. Uh, Mujaku was not that concerned with Dogen, but, and it was kind of easy for him to be somewhat dismissive. He did recognize the importance of Dogen and other Rinzai uh, people from that period, especially Hakuin, did recognize uh, Dogen's importance and often did praise Dogen and they may have criticized Soto Zen other than Dogen. But Mujaku joined forces with um, 10K dense on, on the criticism. Now they go to the point where, well, 10K, being a Soto person, doesn't think of himself as an opponent of Dogen. He thinks he's still Dogen's savior. And so what he does is he comes in and re, starts rewriting Dogen. And basically says, if Dogen could rewrite the Chinese, uh, I can rewrite Dogen. And so he only produced two main commentaries, but those commentaries are rewrites. So to a large extent, they're rewriting uh, Dogen's passages to make them more authentic with Chinese. Now, why was the, that issue so important? Um, of course, uh, because of Confucian influences, because of the influence of the Obaku sect that had come, migrated from China in the 1600s, and because of other kinds of um, secular pressures from the shogunate on uh, creating sectarian identity for the for the different uh, um, sects, especially the sects that had started in the Kamakura period and, and were still prominent, uh, the, um, uh, the, there was a, a strong emphasis on showing the authenticity of Dogen. And that was also true for other figures. Asai, the founder of, of Rinzai Zen, um, for, uh, his, his, um, his main text, the Kozen Gogoku Lon, was also put to this kind of scrutiny and um, it was taken out of circulation for a period of time by some of his followers because they were kind of embarrassed about the fact. Now, 
Asai did not try to do what Dogen did, which was a kind of creative hermeneutics where he's, maybe we could say he's deliberately misreading, he's a genius of misreading, he's, you know, creative misreading. Asai wasn't try, quite doing that, but there are patterns where he seemed to have missed the, the nuances of the Chinese. So one of the interesting things is that in the, in the um, 17th and 18th century, especially the 18th century, the 1700s, and I might have had a typo, in, and now I realize in the, in the slide coming up, but in the 18th century, when almost uh, all of the commentaries I'm talking about were created, so there's dozens of them, um, uh, there was also a ban on publishing the Shobogenzo because the Soto sect worked with the, the Bakfu and they tried to shut down the publishing of it because they were concerned with Tenkei's criticism, Mujaku's uh, comments, and they didn't quite know what to do with it, uh, the Shobogenzo. And there were so many different versions of it. And then once Tenkei's was circulating with the rewrites, um, they tried to say, like, don't publish it, and that ban was enforced for 70 years. So most of the commentaries were written during the ban. That meant that if the commentaries were critical editions, they, they weren't published, apparently. And it wasn't, they couldn't, the authors couldn't trump it, hey, this is what we're doing. Um, so since, um, I think one of Tenke's uh, versions had come out before the ban. Um, what they often did was to comment on his version since that was okay. Uh, technically, it, 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 it wasn't quite as um, uh, subject to the, the, the new ban. In, in any case, those works were being produced. Um, and they got the idea, like, let's have an authoritative version. Let's have one version that everybody can agree to. Well, very difficult under those circumstances, but the idea was put out there as early as the 1690s, and that contained 96 fascicles. There's a woodblock edition of it that was produced in 1806 for the uh, 550th death anniversary. A Dogen died in 1253, but you know, it took a few years uh, to, uh, for those, those death anniversaries could encompass uh, several years of, of production. Sometimes they built new, new buildings at, at the temples um, and new biographies were often part of it and, and new editions of the main text. Um, it's interesting because the 1806 uh, woodblock edition was still incomplete. Um, first of all, mo most people, you know, I think it, I, my kind of joke is if you walk down Russell Square and you ask people, 10 people, how many fascicles in, in the Shobo Genzo are there, what would they say, probably? Nine out of 10 would say, no. <laughs> no, no, in my world, in my world, they all know that. They all know the Shobo Genzo. They would all say 95 fascicles, though. But that, that's the first kind of myth that I want to deconstruct. Um, because even the original version that had 90, that we think of as having 95 actually had 96, and then they took one out, so it became 95. But the 95 fascicles were ordered in very different ways. If you look at, the, at this 18th century period, there was no single 95 fascicle version that had emerged very quickly. Um, and you know, the Japanese scholars have cataloged some of these, and you can see, you can see the differences. They had a lot of uh, debates about how to order the sequence of the 95, and which ones were, should be in the 95, because there were others, uh, some were deliberately left out, there were alternative versions of some that were sometimes included as an alter and listed as a bepone, or they were not included, um, but other people argued they should have been. So, uh, it, w it wasn't easy, and, b and by the time they, um, they produced the woodblock in 1806, it, it, there were only 90 fascicles because there was still much debate about five of them. Now, one of the things was, one of the debates was uh, if they were too controversial because of the apparent misuse of Chinese, that led people to n not come to an agreement. And also, Dogen sometimes harshly criticized Chinese monks like Linji, Dahui, and other prominent figures, and if he, he was too critical, it, it, it seemed kind of embarrassing why he, why he was so polemical, they might have left those out. So that seems to apply to the ones that were left out of, this, of this, 
1806 edition, which only had 90 of the 95. Five more did come out in the mid-1800s, but they were still reluctant um, to go public with it. This was, this was still kept basically within a small circle, so to speak. I, I think that the small circle is not really so small. That's my main point. It was a big circle, but it was still a Soto circle. The 1906 typeset edition exposed it to a much larger circle. And that's when, um, uh, 20 years later, we get the famous um, work by uh, Watsuji Tetsuro, Shamon Dogen, uh, Dogen a monk, and he says Dogen is not part of the sect, or shouldn't be limited to the sect, the sect has gotten corrupt, Dogen is for all humanity. And, and Watsuji's comments didn't come out of a vacuum, that had been building up since late, late Meiji, and, and there were other commentators saying something like that. So the secular viewpoint and what you know, became the Kyoto School of Philosophy got into the picture very early. Tanabe Hajime had a, had a uh, famous uh, short monograph in 1939. Um, and uh, Akiyama Hanji was another figure in the Kyoto School who had a, had a detailed philosophical discussion of Dogen in 1936. Um, but it, that had been building up for several decades. Meanwhile, on the sectarian side, that triggered off dozens of, of new um, commentaries that are more the Teisho style, more the preaching style, rather than a philosophical analysis. And some of the key figures are Nishiari, Nishiari Boksan and uh, Kishizawa Ian. Okay, so before I get to the PowerPoint, one other comment briefly, and we'll come back, is the, uh, the flip side. Uh, I don't want to get, you know, I'm trying not to get too carried away with only the, um, <laughs> uh, these historical oddities about the text, but, you know, what's the result of it? So how, how can it influence our discussion of it? And I want to look at one particular passage which takes a famous koan um, concerning thinking and non-thinking and so, and shows Dogen, Dogen's hermeneutic style of rearranging the Chinese order at work. And um, I also included in the middle of the page um, a little bit of Carl Bielefeld's translation, which was very useful, and some other comments about um, the main uh, concept of hishilyo, or non-thinking, as opposed to not thinking. So I'll come back to that later. All right. Now, um, I think one of the new trends in the Japanese scholarship that's you know, beginning to filter into the Western scholarship is to look at Dogen's, the Shobogenzo, as a provisional and contested uh, text. So we've talked about some of the contests that came up later, but even for Dogen himself, he, he seemed very much torn about the, uh, the content, the writing style, and the intention. And so this is, this is supposed to be uh, a manuscript of Dogen, and we can see him crossing things out, and that's, that's a very important point. One of the famous scholars, uh, one of the, probably the single most famous scholar of Soto Zen studies of Dogen in the post-war period, Kagamishima Genyu, I heard the anecdote that, um, he, um, um, that when the critical Buddhism movement came up in the late 80s and 1990s, and that was challenging a number of uh, orthodoxies in the Soto sect, including uh, orthodox views about uh, Dogen and Shobogenzo, um, Kagamishima, and, and they were pointing out that Dogen had changed his mind quite a bit about what was supposed to be in the Shobogen. So Kagamishima, who's one of the main people who documented all the Chinese influences, and his, his work is still uh, celebrated, but apparently, I, I heard the anecdote that he was he expressed that he was very distraught when some of these manuscripts were coming to light that were being discovered in temple archives in the 80s and 90s, and when you looked at them and you see that Dogen was not pristine, and he, you know, it wasn't the later people that you know, uh, clouded the picture. It was Dogen himself that changed his mind. So, for example, the title Shobogenzo, uh, he, apparently he didn't start using that as the title until the year 1245, and by that time, most of the texts had already been completed. Over three quarters of the fascicles were already completed by, the time, by, 19, uh, by 12, 1245. Um, and then he went back and started renaming them all Shobogenzo Busho, Shobogenzo Genjo Koan. But he had different ideas about, uh, you know, he, 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 he himself was editing. We don't have so many manuscripts that are in his hand, but we can see that he was making a lot of changes. Okay, um, now here's the 
famous cover of the Eihei Shobogenzo, uh, what's called the Honzan edition, the main temple edition, because it was associated with Eiheiji and, and some of the texts that had been stored at Eiheiji. And this is what I was referring to as the 1806 woodblock that, that came out in 1906. At that time, they, they came out in a modern typeset edition in 1906. And then after that, there was a Zenshu of Dogen that came out in 1909 that had a different version. And um, it, by, by then when the Kyoto School got into the picture, uh, there was a scholar named Eto uh, Sokuo who was president of Komazawa University for a while. He came out with a new edition, an Iwanami Bunko edition in 1939 um, that was different from the other two in some, you know, in, a, in some significant ways if, when you look at passages uh, carefully because he did, it, he did some of his own editing. And that came out and that was considered, okay, that was the standards. Four volumes, small paperbacks, easy, easy to acquire. Um, but that became very controversial, uh, actually, after the war. People said that he had misunderstood the earlier <laughs> manuscripts and also that he was, um, but, but also the, the whole attention to the 95 fascicles began to unravel. So we'll go back to Russell Square and inform the people that um, please consider other uh, alternative versions of Shobogenzo editions. Um, but also in 1906, Nishiari Boksan started what they call Genzo E, which still continue at Aheji and other temples, and those were uh, intensive retreats. Um, so probably in the three month summer retreat, this might last for a month and they take one fascicle and discuss that. How uh, creative it still remains or whether it's kind of a, a dry lecture series now and whether it's a, really a creative discussion, that, that can vary quite a bit and there's uh, you know, different comments on that. But apparently it, when it started in the 19, um, when it started in 1906, it was you know, very vigorous um, activity that, that sp uh, spread to a number of Soto temples. But in fact, actually, uh, when you track this down, and David Riggs has talked about this in his work on Menzon, um, there were thousand day retreats that were being held back in the 1700s. And there were also lecture series at several temples, especially in Tokyo, that what we could call Edo seminaries that eventually merged and formed uh, Komazawa University in, 18, in the 1880s. Um, so my point is that there's been a lot of confusion, but there's been a lot of activity as well. And, and I think it's better to look at the activity rather than overlook it um, in order to unravel the confusion. Okay, I put this slide here. This is a modern calligraphy, but um, I think one, one of the stereotypes that sets in is that in this dark, supposed dark age period, people only were fixating on key buzzwords, Shikantaza, Shin, um, Shinjin Datsuraku, Genjo Koan, and um, there wasn't comprehensive studies. Again, I, I think that the numbers speak for themselves in refuting that. Okay, so basically I'm trying to look at the text historical situation, um, tr clarifying when, why, and where Shobokenzo versions and commentaries on them were uh, created. But I want to build up to the philological and philosophical issue of understanding Dogen's rhetoric and how his misreading, or the genius of misreading, as some people call it, uh, does apply to particular passages. And we'll look again at um, Zazen Shin on non-thinking. Okay, so let me review some of the basics of Shobogenzo. Um, uh, there's the, there's uh, an example of a, a Chinzo or portrait of Dogen. Um, this is from, I like this image, it's from the Tenzo uh, Kenzeki Azue, which was also produced in um, a series of illustra 60 illustrations of Dogen's life story that was also produced in in a black and white version that was later colorized in 1806 for, the, for that anniversary of his, of his death. And um, this is uh, Dogen as a young monk uh, when he's debating with the Tendai scholars on Mount Hiei before he leaves Hiei and joins Keninji Temple and studies there and then eventually goes to China. And this is, this is supposed to be the moment where he's debating about uh, Hongaku Shiso and um, whether an original enlightenment um, idea vitiates the need for practice. Uh, okay, four years of travels to uh, China. 
has the experience of casting off body mind, Shinjin Datsuraku, under his Chinese teacher, and um, returns um, to uh, Kyoto and um, in, um, uh, has his first main temple in Kyoto from 1233 to 1243, and then moves to the uh, uh, what's now Fukui Prefecture, uh, or known then as uh, Echizen, um, or the Hokuliku area, and starts a Heiji, and other temples um, accumulate uh, nearby. Heisenji was an old Tendai temple that had been there long before a Heiji, but uh, Dogen's followers started uh, Hokyoji, Daijoji, and then um, in the Keizan era, uh, Yo uh, Yokoji and Sojoji up in the Noto, Noto Peninsula. Okay, now the difficulty of reconciling Dogen's use of Chinese with the, with the Kana commentary was discussed by Giyun in his early um, comments from uh, the 1320s. And in his preface to his, uh, pro, to his verse commentary on the 60 fascicle version, and by the way, the 60 fascicle version, if you ask people, how many, how many fascicles does the 60 fascicle version actually have? 59. <laughs> uh, because uh, one of the ones that is usually divided into two halves is, put in, is not divided in the, so the 60 fascicle version only has 59, and the 95 fascicle version actually has 96. Um, but, okay, so he points out that Dogen had this grandmotherly kindness. That was, that was a typical Song uh, uh, phrase, uh, which was often used in a cynical way. So to have grandmotherly kindness could be good because you're uh, bestowing the teachings to people that don't really, aren't really capable of understanding it, or it could be that you're talking down to people or making it too easy for them. But anyway, he, he's probably using that in a positive enough way. But, and he says that he's trying to kind of go 50-50 here with the Chinese and the Japanese vernacular, but people still didn't understand it. And so he's recognizing this back then, and therefore um, uh, he offers his, his verse comments. I, you know, I'm translating those verse comments, and actually I'm going to include a few of them in, the, in this Saturday seminar, um, but um, I don't know whether they actually make it more understandable or not, but uh, that's another question. Um, okay, so here's a couple of examples um, of, um, some of you may be familiar with some of these examples of what is so um, complicated and intricate about Dogen's use of the, of the Chinese. And uh, I just mentioned briefly, we start with the famous phrase, uh, casting or dropping off body-mind. That was his enlightenment experience under his Chinese teacher, Ru Jing, in 1225. Um, and uh, modern scholars have pointed out, but this was discussed earlier as well, uh, but it, it's come up in a, in a big debate in modern scholarship that, that Ru Jing um, probably never used that phrase. And Ru Jing probably used the phrase casting um, dust off the mind, and maybe Dogen changed it because casting dust off the mind, um, or casting off the dust from the mind, um, might, might sound dualistic, and so maybe Dogen deliberately changed it, but uh, Ru Jing, if you look at Ru Jing's um, uh, collected works in the Taisho edition, uh, it's only mentioned one time in a poem. And, um, you know, it's interesting because the uh, Ru Jing's Taisho edition was all edited by Soto commentators from the uh, Edo period. So um, it's kind of surprising that um, there's still so many discrepancies going on, but we don't know how much Ru Jing would or could have used the original phrase. And then we don't know if Dogen kind of misheard it, because there are homophones in, in English, but, uh, excuse me, in Japanese, but not in Chinese, so maybe he just, he just didn't have an ear for it, or maybe he deliberately changed it. And, and maybe Ru Jing, by, by using the dust, didn't mean dust in the sense of defilement, but just meant dust as a, uh, you know, sense object that was taken in, uh, that created a sense impression and wasn't, it didn't have the dualistic implication anyway. Um, okay, one of the famous examples is when Dogen takes the saying attributed to Mazu, uh, Tang Master, uh, this mind is Buddha, and he picks the words apart and, and rearranges them. Um, very difficult to translate into English. Uh, most translators do try to make sense out of those four phrases, but 
you know, then I thought to myself, uh, I mean, the point was not to really make sense out of it, but just to rearrange the letters. So why does he do that? Um, and he does that with other uh, four kanji um, uh, phrasings in, in other examples as well, but this is probably the most famous one. And then um, for our uh, Muchu Setsumu, uh, disclosing a dream within a dream, he comes up with this kind of construction where the phrase is used three times. Um, muchu Setsumu wa, Muchu Setsumu o, Muchu Setsumu. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I'm not even sure you know, how, how to put it into English. Um, uh, people, other translators have come up with creative ways of doing it, um, but um, is um, it, it, so. So the you know back in ten k's time, the the comment is: Is this much ado about nothing? Is he mystifying us? And we're not, you know, we ha we have to understand that he he himself may not have quite grasped the original meanings. Okay. Uh, you know, contemporary scholar uh, Frederick Girard has has, um, he, he was in a book where he analyzes Dogen's rewriting of one of Ruzhing's uh, poems on the wind bell, uh, a very interesting uh, monograph that, was, that, that he published in, uh, in English in, in Japan a few years ago. Um, but he comes up with the comment that, okay, what Dogen did is, uh, was deliberate, it was intentional, he knew what he was doing, and I think that's the mainstream view. I, I, uh, but there's so many examples that you know, it's hard to make a sweeping statement. Uh, a recent Chinese scholar, um, He Yansheng, who has translated Shobogenzo into modern uh, Mandarin, um, uh, uh, you know, used this phrase. Um, and, um, and so he's coming up with an affirmative factor. And other people have analyzed it in terms of uh, trends going back to Kamakura period of, of uh, taking license to change. And, and we know that an East Asian tendency in, in let's say, in the Waka tradition or in, or in Chinese poetry tradition is to, you know, take the original and make a slight alteration of it, and that shows your originality. So it's nothing new. Dogen didn't invent that trend, and you could see him as one more figure in Buddhist and literary traditions that were longstanding and, and doing his thing. But, um, but he does it to such an extent, and he comes up with with things that are, um, that are clear, but uh, so many things that are quite cryptic and mysterious that, that the question lingers. Okay, so, uh, you know, I discussed that the, um, that during, uh, and that should be 18th century. So, uh, during the ban in the 18th century, there was the rewriting of the, of the Shobo Genzo. And, and it's hard to get, to weed that out now, to know what we're looking at. Um, and as they discover more, um, older, uh, in, in temple archives, as, as they come up with more manuscripts, um, it becomes uh, very confusing. In, in a, you know, for the people that love to study this, it's, it's the, that confusion is a great thing, but it leads to inconclusiveness. Um, for example, um, you know, some of you are familiar with the 12 fascicle Shobogenzo text that was supposedly written uh, towards the end of Dogen's life, it was the new draft. I mean, we can't exactly equate it to what he called the new draft, but more or less that was the new draft. It was written at the end of his life. Uh, most of those fascicles are undated, so we don't know how much Ejo might have edited them, because they're, they're, his records say 1255, two years after Dogen's death, so that's already creating a question mark. But um, the... Um, uh, the point uh, of, the, uh, of the new draft of the 12 fascicle Shobogenzo is that Dogen seemed to have this idea that he was going to start all over again. And he wanted to collect 100 uh, fascicles, but, um, and, and, he, and, and then he started rewriting some of the older ones, and they were quite different style, the, the new draft and the old draft, in a lot of different ways. So uh, he himself was kind of, you know, was torn about uh, what to make of it. And so it was, it was natural that that controversy would follow. Um, all right, so this sums up some of the main points about why there was the revival in the late 16 and 1700s. And um, uh, Geshu, um, uh, there was a monk Geshu uh, Soko that's mentioned on the first page, item number three. Geshu Soko was an abbot at, um, at Aheji in the Edo period who is given credit for triggering off this revival 
uh, of the, the uh, Shuto Fuko idea of let, let's restore the Soto sect as it properly should have been. And he came up with his own version of the Shobogenzo, which had 84 fascicles, and he, he was looking for an authoritative edition. Um, and he made a lot of comments on uh, issues that became very controversial. How many precepts? Because Dogen was known for having only 16 precepts, but was that complete or not? Or did he just offer that for novices and, and not intend that for the high-level monks? And also the succession, whether you had to have face-to-face -face transmission uh, from, from your teacher or whether you could succeed to the abbacy of a temple by selection from another, from another, linea from another temple or another lineage. And so those were the, so Geshe was already commenting on those and trying to organize those around what Dogen himself said in the Shobo Genzo. And then 10K comes into the picture and he, he picks up some of those arguments, but he has, a, he has kind of this insider-outsider view. And he's also, um, he, he's, he's one of the sub-lineages stemming from Geshu. And then the other lineage is on the uh, Banjin Dotan side, and they had the fierce debates and, and back and forth commentaries. Okay, um, all right, so I just threw together here some terms that could be used for re referring to different aspects of textual studies. Some of these terms come from the titles of the 18th century commentaries and some are more contemporary constructions. But if you look at the titles of the commentaries, the, the Shuten idea was used in, the, in both, in both uh, with that variation. Um, so both of those constructions were used in title after title. So pulling out the sources, let's go back to what the Chinese sources were. Now in that sense it's probably true that people weren't looking at it. So in that sense there had been a dark age that for a few hundred years they just didn't pay attention to it. Guillaume probably did know the sources because we can see in his record, even though we don't see it in his verse comments, we see in his other uh, recorded sayings and his other lectures that he was very familiar with the Chinese sources. But maybe some of that knowledge got lost in the 14 and 1500s, and now it was being revived. Um, Chu Shaku in both of those constructions was used in a lot of those titles. Some of these other terms are uh, Meiji era constructions for how to do philo philology, intellectual history, thought, and, um, and hermeneutics. Um, okay. So, um, all right, so I'm going to go very quickly and then and, uh, finish with the um, with Zazen Shin. Okay, so this is what we got to tell the people on Russell Square, that there's a lot of different versions. You know, here is one configuration where we can see all the different, the ABCs refer to different subdivisions of the, uh, this is another flow chart that shows how you can break it up into all these subdivisions. And uh, this, this was done by one of the scholars who preferred the 12 fascicle version. And he tried, some of the arrows are trying to document why, why that reigns supreme or should reign supreme. And, you know, so even to say 95 fascicles is quite misleading because the new collections usually have 75 plus 12 fascicles. That's 87. But then they also have the Bethon, the alternative versions. And if you add them up, a lot of times they magically come out to 95. So people say, aha, that's the same version. It has 95 if you add it all up, but it's, it's quite different when you subdivide 75 plus 12 in the old draft and the new draft. Um, and those, and, and, and in fact, uh, sometimes it, it leads you to the opposite inclusions from the 95. So that's why I call that collected uh, with the subdivisions the de facto 95 version. Okay, so the, another uh, myth uh, is that Dogen wrote it over 20 two years from 1231 to his death in 1253, and we can see that almost all the fascicles, sorry, but, uh, almost all the fascicles were actually written in a six year period. So that's another uh, myth that it needs to get deconstructed. And, um, and in fact, almost all the fascicles were written before Dogen gets to Eheji. Eheji only produced um, less than uh, 20 uh, fascicles. And so that's, that's another myth. Um, this, these two flow charts try to document the, the movement and the linkages between the lineages from um, uh, in the Kamakura period and how those played out 
in the Edo period, revival, and the, and the modern. So we don't have time for, the, for that detail. Uh, so let me go into the uh, Zazen Shin. Um, so here's the, here's the uh, case with a Dogen reading of the case, which he gives in Kana. So the case is a monk says to the master, when you're sitting in, when you're sitting upright, and it doesn't use zazen, but uh, when you're sitting upright or you're sitting steadily or you're sitting in steadfast fashion, uh, what do you think about? A dogen changes that question to, um, you're thinking what? Now, does that make any sense, or is that, is that not? So he, he, he's intervening or intruding into the, into the story uh, from, from the very beginning. Um, and um, in number two, the answer to the question, what are you thinking about, is uh, I'm thinking about non-thinking. I'm thinking about not thinking. But... Again, the twist is given that since you're not really answering a question, the first one is a statement, that this is kind of reinforcing that statement, that the what of thinking is not thinking. Now, on the, on the handout, on that flip side, under number two, under number... <laughs> Yeah, under number two, that bold sentence. Although not thinking may be an idea that has been discussed for a long time, here it means how you do think. So, Dogen's interpretation is that even though he's saying he's, not, he's thinking about non-thinking, uh, it, it, again, it reinforces the original declaration by the, by the monk. And so the monk is not a monk who needs to get enlightened by the master. The monk is in the process of enlightening the master, or at least the interaction between them is mutually reinforcing. Um, so, in response to um, the master's answer to the first comment, question, slash, declaration, in, 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 inquiry, slash, declaration, he says, um, uh, the monk says, um, uh, well, the conventional view, he says, how do you think about not thinking? But in the Dogen reading, he says, not thinking is the how uh, uh, of what you think. So they keep um, reiterating, basically, uh, the point that was made in number one. And the point that made in number one was by the monk, not by the master. And so um, then the master says, it is thinking of nothing. So he changes the, negate, he changes the character from... Negation from fu to he in the, in the Japanese reading. And um, a number three in that flip side of the handout, in bold, um, we have Dogen's comment, although the process of non-thinking seems crystal clear, when we think about not thinking, we are always already non-thinking. Now, the always already, I'm um, using a phrase that's usually connected with uh, Heidegger, um, and, you know, may, may be taking a little license here myself, but the point is that, uh, to simply blur the distinction between not thinking and non-thinking, anyway, and, and the blur the distinction between the three, of thinking, not thinking, and non-thinking, are all in the same, whatever you call them, they're all the same process. Now, if you had to pick one word that was the appropriate word, I think Dogen would agree we would pick he shilio non-thinking. Non as the kind of buzzword to, to use, but the, it's not an opposition, and it, it, there's not this dialectical movement from the lower level of thinking to a higher level of not thinking into another higher level, which is the way it's usually portrayed. So, um, uh, just very briefly here, um, trying to delineate uh, five or six steps of Dogen's rhetorical pattern where he subverts and diverts your attention from the original by picking apart a particular 
kanji or a particular compound and, and misreading it deliberately, we could say, and then further intruding to say, well, this is what they really meant to say, and the commentators have missed the boat. And then probably coming back and inverting that, if you look uh, very carefully at the, at the, at the whole uh, discussion there, you know, he doesn't stick with one clear, clear point anyway, and he kind of leaves it open-ended. And I go back to the Blue Cliff record, which I think is uh, crucial to, to read as a um, predecessor for Dogen. And in the Blue Cliff record, uh, they often end the cases by saying, uh, this is, you know, if I had been there, if only I had been there, this is what I would have said instead of what the master or the monk said, and it would have cleared it all up. But don't take my word for it. What do you think? And they simply end, what do you think, over and over again. Dogen doesn't exactly say that, but I think that's his implication. So uh, you have to decide for yourself. But in any case, this is what I would call the, and, and this is a phrase um, that he does use, the mutually reciprocal satori. He doesn't use it in this passage, but in other passages, he occasionally uses that phrase. That the, and, and, and I have an illustration here. Um, this was adapted from uh, a manga about Dogen um, to show the conventional view that, the, that the, the question and answer are going at cross purposes to one another uh, to the Dogen view of the mutual reciprocity whereby the, the master and disciple are enlightening each other. Since they're all not, we're all non-thinking, we're always already non-thinking from the very beginning. So whether that would clear up all of 10K Densan's lineages um, um, clarifications or, or lack of clarifications about Dogen or not, uh, maybe it gives 10K the license to rewrite. Why not? You know, this is an open text. Dogen was not completed, and only sectarian orthodoxy would get shocked and horrified. So let me end there and take your comments or questions. Okay. and uh, start with okay. very, very general questions about not so, so much about the, uh, the text itself, but the occasions mm -hmm. of uh, reading the text. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the Genzoe, um, and you mentioned also the other people who have done it, uh, who clearly have not done it by themselves, not, not as an individual monk uh, uh, sort of, uh, relating to this text, but as a kind of community, a group engaged mm -hmm. with this text. Mm -hmm. And I wondered uh, uh, what was the occasion, uh, uh, because you mentioned, uh, uh, you know, places in Tokyo that would be after the, the after which would have the university. I, I was thinking of Dangisho, of this kind of very important institutions in Tokugawa, Japan, and uh, uh, actually very early, um, already 16th century, uh, where uh, monks were studying just like we do, just in a, mm -hmm. in a room and uh, taking instructions. Uh, uh, using text, right? And was that the occasion in which yeah, uh, uh, commentaries to the Shogogenzo were produced? And was there an audience that was beyond the commentator, the, the, the writer himself? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, very, very good. And I, I, th I think um, you know, if we recreate the uh, the Tokugawa world, you know, we see that kind of intellectual activity happening. So I think, um, uh, and and that recharged it, yes, because you know. Uh, a few years ago, I got interested in what, what were the origins of the Japanese Buddhist universities, in my case, particularly Komazawa University. So they all started around the 1880s, and they grew out of what we could call temple seminaries, uh, generally, for, right, in, from, the, from the Edo period. So, um, in the, and, then, and then they got formal, they, they increasingly became more formalized as modern universities by the, uh, by the 1920s, and then had other education reform movements during the occupation. And, and generally expanded to include, you know, a lot of secular studies as well. But in the 1880s, you could see the holdover. Um, like so, Kamazawa University was held uh, in the first couple of years at one of these seminaries in in central Tokyo. And there were there were three main places. Um, one was uh, Sengakuji, which is famous for the 
47 Ronin being buried, and it's not, you know, but uh, actually in the, uh, uh, par partly that temple had the prestige to receive the 47 Ronin because it was one of the main, you know, the, that daimyo was connected with the Soto sect, and this was one of the main, uh, uh, because, it, because it had that seminary effect. The, the other, there was, a, uh, another one was Kichi Joji, which is located uh, in uh, Bunkyo Ward, and another one, say Shoji, which is which is located near what's now Kasumi Kaseki area, and so you had those three. And the original Komazawa University in the 1880s was held at say Shoji for a couple of years because they didn't have the other facilities, and they built it. So uh, the stories were that uh, yeah, back, going back, and some of the stories say even before you know even in the 1580s or 1590s before the shogun it gets formalized, you can see that, how reliable those are. We don't know, but they, they talk about this kind of seminary activity of, of intensive studies of Shobogenzo and Dogen's other texts going on for, for many years, and it was very prestigious. So like Menzan, he was kind of not mainstream, so main, even though he was the most famous scholar of that period, in retrospect, at the time he wasn't mainstream institutionally. He wasn't considered one of the big guns either at the, the, the Tokyo seminaries or at a Heiji, but it, he does, uh, he was invited to to give lectures on Shobogenzo at Kichi Joji, and that was like a big thing for him, you know. Um, I think Geshu, they say, was responsible for these thousand-day retreats. We don't know, you know, how, if they actually counted those days or it was just a, a, a very long time. But yes, uh, the, the, it, it was a community effort. That that's true, and that. In a way, that would reinforce some of the lineage stereotypes because you have the sensei and people are revering this, you know, and, and don't want to challenge those words. And I think that's some of what comes through with in the 20th century with Ten, uh, with Nishiari Boksan's lineage and and his followers. But um, but it must have been an exciting time. Mm, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, I mean, I suppose that uh, the classroom setting was the way in which you make commentary. Yeah. Or Kind of uh, uh, issues that you may deal with. What is it that you sort of? I, I mean, how original, how creative, uh, and how originally you are going to intervene right. on, on the text? That's right. what I was, I was thinking. Right. Because you were mentioning so much this, um, uh, the, the question of recreating mm -hmm. Dogen. You know, I I, w I was talking with a friend who who works in Sanskrit, mo mostly in. Um, in Advaita Vedanta, but we were just talking about the way commentaries work, and he was saying commentaries he deals with, they say, well, this is what you know, the outsiders to our, our group say, and they state what it says, and then this is what we say, and then they go on to the next point, and there's not a lot of give and take there. It's just like, that, you know, there's the wrong view, and here's our right view, at least in the sources he was looking at. I think you don't get that, it's not that organized here, but you do get the presumption that each time we're making a point, there is another audience out there of the naysayers or the alternative sayers, and and so I think you know you're stimulating me to re to, to re engage now at some of the specifics and how much can you read between the lines to hear that kind of anonymous dialogue but that must have been there because they yeah they were talking to the people that were there but they were all probably always addressing a point uh, to the people that weren't in that room as well so that community is you know there's kind of a hidden community of the of the alternative views. Yeah. Because sometimes when I've read some of the fascicles, like if you read Carl Bielfeld's uh, translation of Bouchot, right. you have a 30-page fascicle which has 67 pages of notes. Right. And I sometimes wonder and get a bit dispirited that actually, <laughs> given there's so much wordplay yeah. and puns on characters yeah. and misreading, that someone who doesn't read either Japanese or Chinese, that almost any translation is incredibly inaccurate. <laughs> yeah. And, and I just wondered what your view of that, uh, if you are reading a translation, um, how accurate is it? And um, if you were going to read the translation, what one would you use? Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, that's a great question, and I thought a lot about that. And, um, you know, one, sometimes I've, I've seen a sentence that particularly troubles me. So you have. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, in some in some passages, there's, there's like a dozen translations, right? Uh, 
I mean, maybe there's five or six complete translations, but then Genjo Koan or, or Buddha Nature or some of the other famous ones have, have many more. And um, so you could look at a dozen. And in some cases, I've seen that they're, you, you, you don't even recognize that it's the same sentence. And I think in sometimes you see even the good translations leave out part of a sentence occasionally, and, and they kind of paraphrase. So here, like on the handout, let me give an example. So there's that character, there's, um, you know, the original is this interesting um, characters that, uh, you know, some commentators have said look like a mountain yama upside down, um, but, you know, a stroke is missing, but it's supposed to create a physical sense like sitting upright, you know, and, um, and that's the point of that, of, of those characters. So I think uh, Carl Bielefeld said um, steadfast uh, sitting. But one translation said, sitting there all still and awesome like a mountain. And then they kept repeating that over and over again. Um, now, for the non-Japanese readers, is that better? Because you, 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 know, you can see that the, he's trying to bring the wordplay into it. Um, and another translator had still dash still state, still still state, to get the two characters in there. That's a little awkward. Um, uh, so, you know, that's one of many, many, many examples. I think that, um, you know, I don't, I, it's not clear what uh, the Soto project and Carl is going to do with uh, those 67 pages of, you know, he's got two, he's got the notes and then he's got the, sub, the notes on the notes. And when you can click around on the website, you know, when it's working, when the links are working well, um, they've all been stripped off now, in the last, just in the last couple of weeks. But, um, you know, it's, it's just astounding. You know, I printed it out. I've... I've sat there at the computer, and he, you know, he's the one person who has, and he's, you know, he has dug into a lot of these Edo commentaries, and he uses that there, and that's, and that's what's good. So that's phenomenal. But can you, can you skip that and just read it? Um, well, I, I, the other extreme is uh, Kazuaki Tanahashi. Kaz Tanahashi has done a number of translations. He has a, he has a, a complete translation recently. And his theory, and he's got some great documentation. You know, if you look at the appendix, um, in, it usually puts it in the appendix because he doesn't want to have a lot of footnotes. So his, he, you know, he knows the stuff really well. Maybe not, he's not a scholar and, and you know, maybe not as well as Carl, Carl Bielefeld does, but he, he knows his stuff. However, in the translation, he says he wants to make it seem like Dogen wrote in English. And that's his, that's his philosophy of it. And um, so you have the readability versus the reliability. I mean, fortunately, we can kind of navigate between, between those two. Um, the, the translation that's in four, there's four PDFs you can get by Nishijima. He, there's a couple different versions of that. In one version, in the original version, he had a, uh, he had a lot of footnotes. And then in the Numata version, um, it was basically the same translation, but they left out a lot of the footnotes. Also, and he footnoted some things that I think even Bielefeld didn't get to, in 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 some of in some of what he came up with, um, although he doesn't give the the detail backing up some of his claims. But um, what's the uh, best translation? Unfortunately, uh, you know I don't think there'll be just like there's no definitive edition in Japanese. I don't think there'll be a definitive translation because. I don't know what the Soto is going to turn into, but it's, it's going to be too unwieldy. Now, you know, he didn't keep up. I mean, Bouchot, the Buddha Nature Festival, is the one that he went into the most, right? And then it, there may be a half a dozen others that have similar, and then some of them are just one set of notes. You know, when I see one set of notes, I get very disappointed. But uh, <laughs> I don't know what the final product, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. You know, the Soto sect, apparently, I mean, there are the, the debates because they don't want it to be, they want to have a handy volume they can pass out for free at temples that, that even some Japanese could read and, and, and foreign tourists could read. That's what they're looking for. So uh, the, the depth that he went into there may not see the light of day in the end. Yes. Yep. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. That's fine. Um, yeah, I was just wondering what it was that first fascinated you about Dogen and Shotogenzo in particular. Why, why have you spent so much time studying <laughs> right. and talking about it? 
Right, right. Well, you know, I, I don't know if this is a common expression over on this side of the Atlantic, but in America, there's a, we have a saying, you got to dance with the one that brought you. Um, so that's, that's my answer. Like, Dogen kind of brought me to the dance, and so I have to stick with it. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, I, you know, Dogen's not the only person in world, you know, religious or literary history by any means who has an unendingly fascinating, um, you know, text to, to have before us. So you always feel like you're scratching the surface. And, and that's one of the fascinating things. I mean, I think looking back, I was lucky that uh, He Jin Kim's book, Dogen, a Mystical Realist, that has been reprinted, had just come out. The uh, translations in Eastern Buddhist by Norm Waddell and Masao Abe uh, were just coming out. Uh, uh, Jim Kodera had, and then he left the field of Dogen studies, but he had Dogen's formative years in China. That had, you know, so there was some great stuff out there that was very, uh, very stimulating. But um, the, uh, I mean, for me personally, you know, I had started more on, uh, I thought I was going to be interested in more on the classical Chinese side, but I was always fascinated by Japanese um, waka poetry. I had a professor in uh, undergraduate in the department that was then called uh, Oriental Studies Department at, at University of Pennsylvania named E. Dale Saunders. I don't know if that name rings a bell, but he was, he was, he, he wrote a book on Japanese Buddhism but he was mainly a, a literary scholar, and he did some translations of modern novels, but he, was, he, he gave some great lectures on Waka, and then um, you know, it kind of like fused the interest in, um, and, you know, Dogen became a way of fusing those, those interests. So what is the influence of Waka on Dogen? Maybe well, I did translate Dogen's Waka collection, mm -hmm. and again, there's a lot of debates about the authenticity because it doesn't really appear until uh, 1472 is the earliest, and it, it gets embedded into um, a biography of Dogen. So, you know, uh, there's skeptics that, and, and, and because Dogen had a few sayings, like um, he was famous for saying, um, oh, some, pe you know, some Zen people mess around with poetry, but we shouldn't do that. You know, we shouldn't waste our time with that. So that orthodox lineage in Soto following that idea denies that the poems are authentic. But they were, you know, when, when Kawabata Yasunari won the Nobel Prize and he gave his lecture in, back in 69, I guess, um, the first thing he said was the Dogen Waka, a Waka attribute to Dogen. So after that, you know, Dogen's Waka have been on the map. He also wrote more than his share of the Kanbun poetry. It's usually not included in the Gozan book Gaku collections, but one, uh, because that's almost entirely Rinza. Usually they have one or two of, his, of Dogen's poems in there just for the sake of it. But one of the interesting things I've learned in, in, through these studies is, that's another big stereotype, because were there Soto monks in the uh, 1300s, late Kamakura, early Muromachi period, who were doing what the Rinzai monks were doing, which was going to China, studying poetry with the leading uh, monk poets, like Zhang Feng Mingben and, um, and uh, another lesser known one, Gu Lin, who, but probably more important at the time actually, um, and coming back and writing Kanbun poetry. And uh, there were a few, not that many, but it was, it was much more complicated than, than what, what, what seems like. And some of them, there was one a guy named Tai Chi who did write a number of poems about Shobo Genzo during that supposed Dark Age period, and that hasn't really come to light. In fact, Tai Chi's poetry is very extensively discussed in, um, in the Edo period commentaries, just as its own collection. It's got all these commentaries on it, and then his poems on Shobo Genzo have also, were also being discussed at that time. So that's how intricate it, it can get. Yeah. Yeah. The, the genre commentary. So you've given us this kind of summary of scores of, of, of commentaries for Shogun Genzo. You mentioned the Yuki Tokoro, which itself, as we well know, has a multifarious kind of commentary over there. Yeah. There's been more and more interest, you know, in Buddhist studies uh, regarding the genre of, of commentary, right? So I yeah. wonder if Mm -hmm. uh, in, in this context, or...? Uh, yeah, well, um, uh, so 
extrapolate in what sense? Like what? what well, are there any kind of characteristics that you see um, common throughout all of these? All of these they could apply in other traditions or in other lineages. Or <coughs> let, let's stick. Uh, let me stick with. Okay, so I'll stick with the, what what we have on paper here. Okay. Um, well, I, I guess one way to look at it is that there's there's two terms. Uh, one is teisho, in Japanese teisho. Teisho is the common term that's used for a Zen sermon. And teisho can mean like putting forth an idea. So it's a sermon in the sense that I think we would use the word in English, like um, a teacher, a preacher, is taking a passage from a sacred writing and then giving an interpretation that somehow makes it applicable to, to life situations. And, you know, Dogen did some of that himself. Like when he was in China, he wrote some, in those four years in China, he, he, he did what the Chinese masters were doing at the time, which was write poems for lay followers. Um, uh, if there was a death in the family, if there was, um, uh, if, if, if one of the children passed an exam, that he, would, he would contribute to that. He didn't really do much of that lay preaching back in, in Japan, but he did, did seem to do what was com had become common in Song Dynasty China. Um, <clears throat> but uh, Blue Cliff Record and some other collections, uh, uh, koan collections, use the term um, in Japanese, it's uh, hyosho, which is an evaluative commentary. And the evaluative commentary, I think, is, is where you're taking the license to intrude. So the intrusion into the original, and we see that in the Blue Cliff Record and some of the other uh, song commentaries. So uh, you have all these, I mean, what, what happens, I guess, in all the commentaries is that they're commenting on so many different layers of it, and we're just kind of guessing some of the illusions. We can track some of them down, but we don't know all of them. And some of them are Chinese Chan, some of them might be imperial poetry collections or other kinds of legends or mythologies that were circulating at the time, and it's very, very difficult for us to track down exactly what they're referring to. But, but um, <clears throat> uh, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but I guess the, elusive, the elusiveness to multiple layers, and, and we're trying to read between the lines to get, get what they're, you know, to, to uh, tease out what we think are those illusions. Uh, but that's where it gets overwhelming. I mean, it's overwhelming to read it in English with Carl, <laughs> Carl's notes, and it's overwhelming, you know, you, you can get bogged down. Just this term, he, she, yo, you know, on the second page of the, um, on the bottom of that page, uh, the, I, it says notion of he, she, yo, and I just threw in there, um, you know, that could have gone on for 10 pages. Just what different, different commentators from Edo period and modern commentators had said, is he, she, yo, not, you know, a, a negation of thinking on any level or not? Uh, uh, could they refute that or not? One of the interesting comments is by a contemporary scholar, Tsunoda. Um, well, uh, let's go to Nishiari Boksan. Um, th thinking has completely dropped thinking. It is the thinking of how. Similarly, not thinking, non thinking, does not abide in not thinking. Both thinking and not thinking have been dropped off. So he's connecting it all with the Shinjin Datsuraku idea. Um, yeah, I'm still not sure if I'm answering your question, but um, uh, one thing is the, um, I, I guess it, go, it goes back to Lucia's point about, you know, what was going on in Edo period. Can, and, and you said, if I, think, I think your phrase was, they're doing very similar to what we're doing now, right? Well, the, the idea of the dangi, of the, of the, yeah, of the academy, let's say, of Buddhist studies, of right, the center right. of Buddhist studies, so where actually people can, don't need to be sectarian, as sectarian concerned as they will become at the end of it. That was why I was interested. Okay, so, so, there, was, so there was more stimulation to be non-sectarian, or trans-sectarian, or... The temple that is known ah, as the center of Buddhist studies. Like, uh -huh. I think of the Tendai uh, Dangisho, uh -huh. and they are like, th there may be some monks who are not actually uh -huh. belonging to the sub-branch, sub-lineage to which the temple would belong, but they were there because that was a center of study uh -huh. of that kind of stuff. So that's really interesting uh, for me, thinking about uh, how these commentaries do get something else which is not within a specific lineage, how they are influenced by other, mm. uh, uh, other takes. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, so yes. That, that, that was a, a, so you're saying it was a more fertile question. time in the... Um, yeah, yeah. And okay. a question that 
it yeah. could, uh, could be, uh, to, to my eyes, it can, can, uh, can include also this. So right. the, the ones, the styles that you mentioned are typically Zen, whereas I think he wanted to know something more generally about Buddhism, right? This is what you said, what can we expect from this? Yeah, yeah, uh, those are good like, questions. Is yeah. there no shogun toto kikigaki or, uh, or kakigaki, or one of those things, yeah. I, uh, which come from oral uh, transmission? Or oral well, yes, transmission actually that first... Subject. The first prose commentary, that's exactly what it was. Yeah. So, so, I mean, so let me make two points. Kiki, yeah, yes. Right, right. And, um, um, yes, so an oral... Uh, so that was two layers. There's, it's attributed to Sene and Kyogo. Sene's yeah. Kikigaki uh, only appears in, in um, his disciple Kyogo's interpretation of it, but in his interpretation of it, sometimes he challenges it. But you can see it, you know, but it doesn't exist, it, 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 somehow it stopped existing as an independent text, probably because it was oral and Kilgo was the only one who had the record of it. Um, I, but, you know, I think when you get to Edo period, there was more emphasis on let's produce a written, the, yeah, yeah. So a lot of it had to do with these um, discussion sections or these preaching sections, but let me make one other comment about uh, cross-fertilization. Um, that. It's just an anecdote, which is that, you know, Komazawa University the, the, likes to, uh, the nickname in the school song uses the, the term Sendarin, which um, was, uh, means, it goes back to a Tang Dynasty Chan poem that talked about, you know, a true temple is like a sandalwood forest. It's very pure and clear and smells fresh. And, and um, so the seminary, one of the seminaries, Kichi Joji, they claim that in the early 1600s, even before some of these famous names got associated with, with preaching terms there, uh, there was a Chinese visitor. It's not clear whether that was connected with the Obaku. I think it was supposed to be earlier than the Obaku. But somehow there was a Chinese visitor who was not associated with their lineage, was visiting, and he said, oh, you know, there, you, this is a Sendarin uh, atmosphere here. And so you can still see that sign up at the temple, you know, the calligraphy, and they're very proud of that. Whether whether that claim now makes any sense or they become a mouthpiece for the, orth for the sectarian orthodoxy that's set in later is, is another thing. But yeah, I think uh, you know, that's a very good point about the, those early, that early period must have been quite, yeah. There is a question here before we have to close. Okay. Um, I'm very interested by, and you showed us the autographs of uh, Noble Bunsell. Yeah. And, I mean, this is something for the 13th century, I don't know how common it is, but it's, it's something that makes me think. Sometimes with this um, author text, we think, okay, there is a text, and then there is the reception history of the entire tradition, but we don't really have a, an insight into the formation of the text, of, 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 the, of the work itself. Right. Well, I mean, you know, just our own books maybe takes many years to write, and then, you know, we, we change the title, we change the order, something we take from chapter one, we put it in chapter five, because it's more, you know. So I was... I wonder how much insight do we have from these materials into the formation history of the work, but also perhaps the intellectual uh, development of himself, of, right. of the author, but also in the context in which he was operating. So, for example, what kind of intellectual practices were there? Like we would maybe send the draft to a colleague and then have comments and right. then maybe correct or. You know, right. some colleague publishes something and then we all of a sudden want to respond to that and then we add a section or... So is there any, you know, looking at those autographs, is there any idea of how he was working on the text? Yeah, well, um, good. So a couple things. One is a point that I was trying to make earlier, but it may have slipped my mind, which was the 12, that 12 fascicle, that new draft text, that wasn't really discovered until 1927. Um, and that changed the landscape very much so. And, and there was a brand new fascicle that nobody had ever heard of that was included in that. That was, that was found at that Yokoji temple up in uh, Noto Peninsula, um, which was a Kazan lineage temple. So which, for some reason, they were storing that, uh, you know, that manuscript. It was a, just a rumor until then. Dogen had a famous uh, collection of 300 cases of koans that with, without any commentary that was done in the t 1235. That was also a rumor, and there were some comments on it in the Edo period, but nobody was really sure whether it existed or not. And that was also discovered in, in these archival hunts that uh, modern scholars have done. <clears throat> so that's, that's uh, 
uh, one aspect of it. Another thing that I think is exciting is, yeah, you can get a sense from different indications. Here we see a manuscript where he's crossing out. There's other manuscripts where you can see that there's a, there's a fascicle, Daigo, Great Enlightenment. Now we have like six or seven different versions uh, that, uh, of, of either in Dogen's hand or Ejo's hand to compare them. And some of them are quite different. And some of them overlap with passages in his other, his other writings. Lai Hai Tokuzui is the one where he particularly talks about whether women can get enlightenment, enlightened or not. You know, the, 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 there's a 28 fascicle uh, edition of Shobogenzo that has a very different version of it than what we normally see in the, in the 95 fascicle. Sometimes the translators have thrown in a few passages from that at, at the end. Uh, so uh, to me, it makes it even more exciting. Uh, other people may get distraught, but um, uh, one last point about it is the postscripts sometimes talk about the atmosphere when Dogen gave, uh, gave his lectures. So, you know, in, in one fascicle he says, like, what he really liked about uh, Rujing was that he would wake people up in the middle of the night, they'd bang the drum, they'd get people, and he was going to give a sermon, and then they'd line up for the, the personal interviews. And Dogen said that nobody else in China could do that. Well, we don't know if others were doing it or not, but Dogen did give some midnight lectures that are included in, in Shobo Genzo. Uh, so Komyo, bright light or radiant light, uh, that was supposed to have been given on the dreariest day of the year in the rainy season, you know. Um, and, and so his words brighten that night. Um, the, uh, uh, bai, bai Ka, uh, plum blossoms, you know, a symbol of renewal uh, from winter to spring, that was given after you know, a huge blizzard took place in Echizen. So, so we, we see him responding, you know, that, I think that's, that makes it even more fascinating. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Well, it was a very great pleasure. Okay, to thank you. A bit more on the Shabogenzo, and uh, thank you very much thank for you. responding to so many questions.